Can human bodies spontaneously burst into flame? Suddenly, you just erupt it in a cloud of smoke. With victims burned to ash and bone, something gruesome has happened here. Could a mysterious blaze be incinerating people from the inside out? These are the most unique fires. Or does science have another explanation? And all of a sudden, boom, you know, epiphany. An investigation of spontaneous human combustion leads from grisly cases to startling conclusions. March 26, 1986. Firefighter Bob Purdy responds to a house fire in Crown Point, New York. It was dark. The inside of the house was quite warm, humid, sweet smelling. And uh, when I finally got to the bedroom, I was astonished. I've seen a lot of fires with fatalities. I never saw anything like this. A fire has consumed the bed, burned a hole in the floor, and melted a television set. Everything else seems untouched, until Pretty realizes that he's looking at the remains of fellow firefighter George Mott. It appears the victim burst into flames, so suddenly he had no chance to escape. You look at the bed, there was nobody there. You see the outline of a man, or a person human, but a little bit of a right leg, a little bit of a skull, that's it. And eventually find approximately three and a half pounds of human being from a 180 pound man. The coroner reports that George Mott's remains, including his head, fit into a shoebox. For Purdy, the case remains a mystery from the coroner to the state police investigators. We all were very baffled. We really didn't know what the hell happened. Researcher Larry Arnold has studied George Mott's death, and he believes it's a classic case of spontaneous human combustion. Everything between that kneecap and George Mott's head was burned to calcined powder that burned through the mattress, through the floor below the bed, and into the crawl space underneath. Trained as an engineer, Arnold is director of Parascience International, a group dedicated to challenging orthodox science. He thinks of spontaneous human combustion as the fire within. Every fire, we are told, is unique. Some fires we submit are just more unique than other fires. And these are the most unique fires that history so far has presented to mankind for study. Arnold detects a common pattern in cases of spontaneous human combustion. A classic case of so-called spontaneous human combustion will basically look like this at the fire scene. The first responders will see a localized, apparently intense point of combustion that consumed the victim. The torso will most often be consumed to powder, leaving behind perhaps the extremities of the lower legs, the lower forearms, perhaps the upper shoulders and head. For believers in spontaneous human combustion, there are four key traits that define the phenomenon. First, there is no obvious source for the fire. The body bursts into flame on its own. Second, the blaze barely spreads beyond the victim's body. Third, flames reduce the torso to bone and ash, leaving extremities unburned. And fourth, it appears the fire erupted so quickly, victims had no chance to escape. These are the images of spontaneous human combustion. Piles of ash surrounded by legs, an arm, or even a head. George Mott's case is just one of hundreds recorded since the 1700s. Arnold has studied most of them. What sparked his lifelong interest was the case of Mary Hardy Reeser, known as the Cinder Woman. Mary Hardy Reeser's death in 1951, July 2nd, set off a firestorm of controversy and heated argument that really extends right to the present day. Mary Reeser managed to burn up, leaving behind one foot, 
a few pieces of calcined vertebra, a piece of tissue that was identified as probably liver, and most controversial perhaps of all in this limited physical remains was a ovoid mass identified at the time as her head. The body was burned so thoroughly that the firemen literally had to shovel her remains out of the fire scene. Almost nothing else in the house burned. There was no apparent flame source. And all that was left was a pile of ash and limbs. Her case fits the pattern of spontaneous human combustion, but it's not the only unsolved case. One case stands out from the rest. The victim was Helen Conway. In 1964, she went up in flames. All that was left was a pile of ashes and two legs. But this time, the fire chief could construct a timeline. Conway's granddaughter had been with her, then went to buy cigarettes. While she was gone, her grandmother died in the fire. According to the fire chief's timeline, Helen Conway would have been almost completely reduced to ashes in just 21 minutes. The blaze took less than half an hour to reduce an average-sized woman to this. What sort of fire could possibly burn a human body that quickly? Don Conkle doesn't think it was an ordinary blaze. He has been a firefighter in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for more than 30 years and chief for 25. In all those years, he's never seen anything like the Mott, Reeser, or Conway cases. I've been to thousands of fires in my career. Of the fires that I've responded to, there's probably been 60 to 70 fatalities. We've had fires from where the entire room has gone to flash over and been involved in fire to the entire building really being involved almost to the point of collapse. And in all those circumstances, recovering victims out of those buildings, the body's damaged, but it is recognizable as, as being human. First responders who have witnessed bodies burned beyond recognition rarely forget what they've seen. Fire and arson investigator Vince Calcagno is still haunted by a case that's almost 30 years old. This was absolutely the strangest fire scenario I have ever seen in my professional career. I'm looking for new information to try and fit these pieces together. Three decades later, he compares notes with the first paramedic on the scene that night, Jim Grissom. I stood there in utter amazement and tried to digest what are we seeing? It was not obvious at all. It was Thanksgiving, 1979, in Bolingbrook, Illinois, at the home of Beatrice Oski. Grissom, Calcagno, and firefighter Daryl Hafner respond to reports of a fire. Hafner spots what he thinks is a pile of ash in the Oski family room. But when he and Grissom approach, they're shocked by what they find. After I walked around and got squarely in front of where the chair had been, you could see two legs. And at that point, and realized that there was a, that was a person sitting there. We could see shoes, but it was difficult to really comprehend that those shoes were on the feet and the legs of someone who was in the chair. And that's about all that was clearly identifiable. The rest of it was pretty pretty difficult to, to make an exact determination of what was there. The incident was so strange, it troubles Calcagno to this day. When I originally walked in that resident, I could not believe that I was in the right location. Normally, I would have expected to see some heavy fire damage and heavy sooting on the walls, staining on the outside of the structure, something to indicate that there was a fire of some great intensity that could have caused the demise of a human. Just like other cases of possible spontaneous human combustion, the fire that consumed Beatrice Oski damaged very little else, not even a wooden dresser that was only feet away. There was no sign of what started the blaze, and the only thing left of her were legs. It just didn't look or smell like a typical fire to the first responders. Normally, if you come in on a, a body that's been in a building for a period of time or is burned up, you're going to smell something from the body, and we didn't even get any indications of that. Combustibles like linens, 
newspapers, furniture, plastic slip covers inches away from the point of combustion that consumed the individual will be largely intact and undamaged. The white stockings looking as pristine as new as if she had just washed them. The afghan on the floor was as clean as if it had just been laundered. It's literally an inch or two away from the, the fire that consumed much of Mrs. Oski's body. Consumed by fire, George Mott, Mary Hardy Reeser, Helen Conway, and Beatrice Oski all died in mysterious blazes. There's no clear ignition source. It's hot enough to burn everything down to ashes, bones, and limbs. But the inferno doesn't spread beyond the bodies. Strangest of all, when witnesses come upon the scene, it looks like the victims were caught by surprise and engulfed before they could react. All died alone, but there is a timeline for Helen Conway's case. The fire chief estimates that it took just 21 minutes for Conway to burn in the time it took her granddaughter to leave the house and to buy her cigarettes. Was her death caused by spontaneous human combustion? Or could an ordinary fire burn a body this quickly? There's a place where experts can answer this question. A place where specialists burn thousands of bodies every day, the crematoriums. Cremation is the reduction of human remains to their basic elements of bone and ash. And that's done through flame, heat, and vaporization. As president of Matthews International, the world's largest manufacturer of cremation equipment, Paul Rahill focuses on finding the most efficient way to transform a body to ash. This piece of equipment is a Power Pack 2 cremation system. It cremates in about two hours, uh, which is a sufficient amount of time for a cremation uh, facility like this. A technician places a steel identity disc in the chamber to make sure there's no confusion about whose remains they are. The cremation system starts out preheated to around 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt aluminum. Once it's up to temperature, we raise the door, introduce the body and its container into the cremation chamber, close the door, and the cremation cycle begins. This time, they leave the chamber door open to show the process. Five jets along each side accelerate the burn, which reaches 1,800 degrees, hotter than some house fires. In the chamber, the body burns from the outside in, starting with the hair and skin. About 85% of the body is water, which vaporizes in the high heat. The combustible solids, mostly fat and muscle, catch fire and burn. The body turns to vapor, smoke, and ash. Most cremations take between two and two and a half hours. The remaining ashes account for about 5% of the original body weight. Cremation reveals what it takes to burn a body. 10 burners at 1,800 degrees, going for two hours. But in cases of spontaneous human combustion, there was no ignition source even close to this hot. Plus, many of the spontaneous human combustion sites are filled with materials that should catch fire at that temperature, but the flames didn't spread. And in Helen Conway's case, she burned in just 21 minutes, far less than the two hours of a cremation. What sort of fire could possibly produce these scenes? Larry Arnold thinks it's spontaneous human combustion. And he has an unconventional theory for how the fire starts. He believes there's a subatomic particle called the pyrotron that science hasn't yet detected. In a rare set of conditions, the pyrotron slams into another subatomic particle inside the human body triggering a nuclear chain reaction. Arnold calls it a personal Hiroshima. According to Arnold, the fire doesn't spread because the reaction stops when the human fuel is spent. To Vince Calcagno, the spontaneous human combustion theory fits what he saw at Beatrice Oski's house. 
based on what I saw, uh, there is a possibility that Beatrice could have burnt from the inside out, but I don't understand the science of that. Could spontaneous human combustion really account for these deaths, or are these just normal fires that look strange to the untrained eye? Joe Nickel is lead investigator at the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. He's made a career challenging extraordinary claims about paranormal mysteries. He agrees that spontaneous combustion occurs, just not inside humans. As a kid, you know, was had a chemistry set and I could make things spontaneously combust. So as I got older, I always wanted to know just what is the answer here? Spontaneous combustion occurs when an object reaches a high enough temperature to self-ignite. Nickel demonstrates how this can happen when chemicals like potassium permanganate and glycerin are combined. And we'll hope for the best to see what happens. The combination produces an exothermic reaction, creating heat and ultimately fire. That's spontaneous combustion, but fortunately, I was back far enough to keep it from being human combustion. It doesn't take an outside ignition source to start an ordinary fire either. Fires can start when combustible materials and oxygen are exposed to high enough heat. Dr. John DeHaan is a leading expert on how fires start. One of the world's top fire scientists, he's literally written the book on combustion. At a fire testing facility in Kelso, Washington, he demonstrates how household chemicals can cause spontaneous combustion. What we're gonna do is try a couple of self-heating experiments with a couple of different wood finishes that are commonly used. He soaks two sets of rags, one in tongue oil, the other linseed oil. Both are commonly used for varnish. Woodworkers have stuffed rags like these into an enclosed space, annoyingly lighting the fuse for a later calamity. Linseed and tongue oils are unusual in that they produce heat as they dry. If they raise the temperature to more than 650 degrees, they'll catch the rags on fire. This may go off in three or four hours. We'll just have to see. One hour later, nothing from the tongue oil, but the linseed oil is rising to 230 degrees. He checks again three hours into the test. Temperature inside the barrel is over 650 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're very close to the auto ignition temperature of the, of the cotton rags themselves. We have flame at 1538. Basically, it was at five and a half hours from the time we started. So the plastic uh, bucket is now being involved in the fire. Under the right conditions, materials self-ignite. But can humans spontaneously combust? Investigators separate fact from fiction by recreating a spontaneous human combustion scene, complete with a pig corpse standing in for a human victim. Bizarre flames spring up without warning, consume their victims, and ignite a firestorm of controversy. George Mott, engulfed in an inferno, while just feet away, his television barely melts. Mary Hardy Reeser turned to cinder except for her foot. Helen Conway consumed and reduced to ashes in just 21 minutes. And Beatrice Oski burned to death while nothing nearby, including her cotton socks, catches fire. Are they victims of spontaneous human combustion? Or is there a scientific explanation for what killed them? These aren't isolated cases. Hundreds of incidents have been recorded all the way back to the 1700s. In the 1800s, social reformers blamed a much maligned malady, demon rum. They saw a connection between alcohol and these fires. 
the idea was that maybe their body tissues just became so saturated with alcohol that they, their flammability was heightened. And you can see how in the middle of the 19th century uh, that could have seemed almost to make scientific sense. It's utter scientific nonsense, actually. If it's not alcohol, is there another chemical chain reaction that could trigger the fires? Larry Arnold points out that skeptics and scientists are unwilling to consider what seems obvious to him. Spontaneous human combustion. Mainstream science has no problem with spontaneous combustion, but when you inject human between spontaneous and combustion, you unleash a firestorm of derision, denial, and ridicule. For spontaneous combustion to occur in humans, it would have to start inside the body and radiate outward. Arnold has an unorthodox theory on how this happens. He believes a still-to-be-discovered subatomic particle he calls a pyrotron strikes another subatomic particle inside the body. The collision triggers what amounts to a runaway nuclear explosion. Once this reaction takes off, it blazes out of control and burns the body from the inside out. It's a theory. We can't prove it, but it's worthy of consideration in this larger mystery that history presents to us as spontaneous human combustion. This is not something known to science, so it, you, you could call it X-force or X-factor. It's a pseudo-explanation. It doesn't explain anything. The chemistry of human fat is uh, not supportive of the kind of chemical reactions that have to go on uh, for self-heating to occur. So the theory that this is a chemical reaction within the body producing an unusual amount of heat just doesn't, doesn't work. Dehan believes in a much more established theory based on scientific principles. Well, even good fire investigators you know, will look at a fire and go, oh, that's, this is really strange. Well, yeah, it might be strange, but there's always an explanation, scientific explanation. Dehan believes that cases of spontaneous human combustion are really caused by what he calls the wick effect. In the wick effect, a thick layer of fat under our skin provides the fuel. Once a fire heats it up, fat starts to liquefy. After the skin splits open, the fat is drawn from the body by clothes or other flammable material. What happens is that as the, as the fire chars the surrounding material, that charred material acts as a wick. And the body fat renders down, is absorbed into that wick material, and that's what actually supports the combustion of the body. When heated, subcutaneous fat burns almost as well as diesel fuel or candle tallow. I can get a lot of heat uh, out of every gram of, of subcutaneous body fat. So you're getting not a quick burnover like in a lot of cases of fire, but you're getting the bodies almost feeding on itself. At the Kelso Test Facility in Washington State, fire expert John DeHaan creates a scene that could double for a spontaneous human combustion case. A cotton mattress is added like the one George Mott slept on before he was reduced to three and a half pounds of ash. Yet his dresser and TV were barely damaged. Beatrice Oski burned just inches from highly combustible materials like a blanket and newspaper. So DeHaan places a cardboard box close to the mattress. All that remains is the fuel source. In this case, a 250 pound pig carcass. Pigs are omnivores like humans. Their body temperatures and their body masses are equivalent. Many of their organs are equivalent. So it wasn't surprising to find out that the combustion properties of pig fat were identical to those of, of human fat. This uh, fire will not be started with any kind of accelerant. It is uh, basically just going to be a crumpled sheet of paper tucked under the edge of the blanket, right where the carcass clothing lies. For the wick effect to take hold, the bedding must char without completely burning. This way, it will heat the body and absorb the liquefied fat. 
After an hour, the pig's fat has begun to liquefy, and it's burning well. Probes indicate that overall, the fire is a relatively small one. In fact, it's about 20 or 25 kilowatts at its maximum. Office wastebasket is typically on the order of 100 kilowatts. So uh, we aren't even up to the energy produced by a, by a wastebasket fire yet. Two hours into the experiment, the fire still seems small, but the localized flames burn extremely hot. Let's see if we can get a temperature. Previous testing indicates that these flames are about 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually about the same temperature you get from a commercial crematorium. So far, this scene seems to match spontaneous human combustion in two key ways. The fire is burning the pig, and it's not spreading beyond the body and bed. The dresser and TV look just like those at the Oski and Mott houses. Even a cardboard box only a few inches away doesn't ignite. But then, at four and a half hours, the fire dies. At this point, basically all of the subcutaneous fat along the back has been uh, consumed and uh, we're basically running out of fuel in this arrangement. Far more of the pig remains than the heap of ashes and bones in spontaneous human combustion cases. Nihon's experiment is a partial success. The fat did burn as predicted, and the dresser and TV looked just like the Mott and Oski cases. But the experiment falls short of turning the corpse into ash and bone unlike the bodies found at possible spontaneous human combustion sites. Dehan isn't surprised. You have to have an external fire, flaming fire, that causes the skin to shrink and split, and then the rendered body fat has to be absorbed into an appropriate wick, and that's a rare combination to have all of those factors in place. Larry Arnold remains unconvinced. He's not proven his case. Don't massage the failed evidence and apply it to what history presents are conditions that belie the circumstances and the conditions that he used for his experiment. Scientists and believers have put their theories on spontaneous human combustion to the test. John DeHaan focuses on a theory called the Wick Effect for answers while Larry Arnold looks to evidence within the human body to explain these rare and mysterious cases. But neither produces definitive proof. The clearest evidence may come from a careful examination of each case. All agree that the victims suffered a horrible fate. The photographs really are, are graphic representations of the mystery. You get the story pretty quickly that something gruesome has happened here. But they disagree on the cause of death. Are these examples of spontaneous human combustion, or can they be explained by science? Perhaps some clues have been overlooked. First up, the fire that fully consumed George Mott, his bed, and the floor below, yet the house didn't burn down. Local investigators looked for malfunctions in George Mott's furnace, in the gas lines, in the stove in the kitchen, looked at appliances. They could find nothing external, nothing technical that in any way they could link to the mechanism that caused the fire to ignite around or in George Mott. We spoke to the, the family members, and they are adamant that George Mott had not smoked for years. Just like with other cases of spontaneous combustion, the fire didn't spread. Fireman Bob Purdy had never seen anything like it. Sitting on top of that machine was a canister of long stick matches that did not ignite. But where others see evidence of spontaneous human combustion, Joe Nickel finds clues of a different kind. The Mott case can be made to sound very mysterious. Mott didn't smoke, there's no, no electrical source. Let me mention just a few little, little facts. Mott was a former smoker, and Mott was depressed. 
and a person who's depressed might say, well, what the hell? Uh, they might smoke a cigarette. Also, Mott had a, an oxygen accelerator unit by his bed. It was on. It was running. The mask was off. Why was his mask off? Let's put some clues together here. What on earth do you have a canister of matches on top of an oxygen unit for? Maybe you were smoking a cigarette, and that would explain why the mask is off. Hello? Nickel reviews the case of Mary Reeser, the cinder lady. The fire that sparked Arnold's lifelong fascination. Reeser lived alone and was consumed by flame in the course of one evening. The next day, all that remained was part of her foot. This was a very famous case, the Cinder Woman mystery. And as told, it does seem quite mysterious, even kind of spine tingling. It turns out that when last seen, Mrs. Reeser was smoking a cigarette. She had taken two second all sleeping tablets and told her son she planned to take two more before retiring from bed. Right here, I think as any sensible person can see that this is an accident waiting to happen. Believers of spontaneous human combustion see similarities in all these incidents. But Nickel detects a different sort of pattern. Many of the victims are older, often ill, heavy drinkers or users of sleeping pills and smokers. Helen Conway was ill and a heavy smoker, but one unusual feature from her case stands out. She burned up in less than half an hour in the time it took her granddaughter to go buy cigarettes for her. The maximum time allowable for this remarkable fire scene to have occurred is no more than 21 minutes, max. It would take a professional crematorium at least two hours at 1,800 degrees to reproduce the same results. I have a situation where the physical reality of a fire says I had to have X amount of time to do that, and a witness says, well, I was gone for 20 minutes. I tend to distrust the eyewitness because she took a lot more than 20 minutes to accomplish that damage. If you want to say that the granddaughter was lying to the fire officials, and the family who had gone to church that morning left Mrs. Conway alone upstairs, presumably smoldering overnight, they're going to have to call all of the wires. And Arnold believes there are living, present-day victims. Without warning, people burst into flame, leaving behind a horrific scene. Larry Arnold points to a paranormal phenomenon called spontaneous human combustion. While John DeHaan and Joe Nickel look to mainstream science for an explanation. To a small group, however, there's no debate. They believe they've experienced the mystery firsthand and live to tell about it. It's so strange what happened that uh, for years we didn't even talk about it. Peter Jones, survivor. His wife, Barbara Jones, eyewitness. I get up in the morning and get ready to go to work. Just a normal day for me. But he had sat down on the edge of the bed to put his boots on. He always wore boots to work. Suddenly, he just erupted in a cloud of smoke. At first, Peter doesn't notice the smoke or any signs of heat. But by the time his wife rushes to his aid, he is already totally engulfed. Barbara pats at his lower body, attempting to put out the fire. He was covered in smoke. No flames. No flames at all. No flames and only a faint smell. It did have a metallic taste to it, more than a smell. Less than a minute after it began, the smoke clears. The couple is startled, but no harm seems to have come from the incident. Peter leaves for work shortly after. For the rest of the day, I just had a very eerie feeling. I mean, it was really weird, and uh, I had no idea that it would ever happen again. Later that day, Peter is on his way home from work 
when whatever is smoldering inside his body reignites. While stopped at a train crossing, smoke begins to seep from Peter's arm pores. It quickly fills the car's cabin, and he is forced to roll down the window. After the smoke filled the car, I had that same metallic taste that I had the first time. And then it just blew out the window and disappeared. Unhurt and unmarked, Jones decides not to seek medical help. This was something that, I mean, I have no idea what it was, and I don't think any doctor would know what it was. Either. There was nothing to show the doctor. Yeah. There was no visual. For Larry Arnold, Peter Jones's story is compelling proof that spontaneous human combustion does exist. We have absolutely no evidence, no reason whatsoever to doubt this story. It was brought to us openly, forthrightly, without any hidden agenda. And we take their testimony as they presented it to us. An honest account of something truly bizarre, truly miraculous, and fortunately for both of them, survived. The account that Peter and Barbara Jones provide to us is important because it says this phenomenon does not always have to be fatal. Clearly, it can be survived. And it still raises profound questions. It will take more than personal accounts to convince Joe Nickel. Without physical evidence, it's hard to call this case proof positive. If they don't have medical documentation, well, I'm sorry, we're going to wait for a better case. Tannis Hellowell's case is one of the most compelling. Somehow I knew that although I was on fire, and that's the way it felt, that I wasn't going to fully ignite and go up in smoke. Tannis Hellowell lives in British Columbia. She's created a sanctuary here, but starting 20 years ago, her charmed life has been shadowed by something sinister. I would have these second degree burns on my face, on my body, on my torso, on my thighs, on my arms. And they, there would be blisters that would be this large that would swell up and then they would, they would break and they would be like running sores. When I ended up in the emergency the first time, I could see by that uh, approach that this was not going to work. They had no explanation for it. They diagnose a bad sunburn, even though she'd just returned from Alaska, where the sun was up only three hours each day. From then on, Tannis has opted to self-treat her burns. It was as if I had been plugged in a socket and that my body could not take the amount of energy charge and was shorting out the socket. I would have to go and sit in uh, water for hours and hours and hours. That was the only relief that I, I had. Joan Nickel remains unconvinced. If someone is claiming that they've survived spontaneous human combustion, it's their burden of proof. The, necessity of proving a negative uh, uh, shouldn't be inflicted upon a poor skeptic. Fire and arson investigator Vince Calcagno was one of the first responders on the scene of the Oski case. If anyone can provide Calcagno with an answer, it's Dr. Elaine Pope. At the University of Arkansas, she's known as the Dame of Flame. She's highly respected in the fire research field and tops in a macabre specialty called taphonomy. Taphonomy is just anything that happens to the body after death. So it can be maggots, it can be decomposition, it can be burial. The part of taphonomy that I'm most interested in is how fire affects the body. In one of Pope's experiments, she placed a cadaver on a carpet in an abandoned house. She gave the experiment a little boost, however, pouring a quart of gasoline on the cadaver's chest. Here at 45 minutes, we've got not only the body fat dripping out, but you also notice the legs are starting to kind of spread out. As the torso burns, fire shrinks muscles and tendons, pulling in the arms and legs. 
This draws the body into what Pope compares to a boxer's pose. Calcagno immediately recognizes the posture from pictures of Beatrice Oski. To tap Pope's expertise, Calcagno shows her the Oski case file. The images present some interesting clues. No clear signs of an ignition source. Objects near the body are barely damaged by the fire. The body itself is reduced to ash except for the extremities. The scene looks familiar to Pope. Her own experiments with human cadavers produced the same sort of results. She's found that it only takes a small ignition source, like a dropped cigarette. An unconscious or sickly victim doesn't notice the smoldering fire until too late. The fire preheats the skin and fat, and the wick effect begins. But why would a fire that feeds on the human body not consume the extremities, like in the Oski and Helen Conway case? Your lower legs don't have as much body fat. They're, you think of your calf muscles, and they're, they're just thick muscles, and you've got really thick bones down in your legs, and there's, there's not a lot of body fat there. And so the fire, once it travels down there, there's not a lot of fuel to sustain it. Another puzzling trait of the Oski case and other spontaneous human combustion sites is how little remains of the victim's skeleton. Pope has experienced this in her tests as well. First started noticing this like in, in car fires. It's like, well, maybe there was an impact and they broke their arm. Then start seeing them in house fires. And it's like, whoa, you know, this is in Kansas. The houses aren't going 90 miles an hour and slamming into things. Why, why is the arm breaking away? And it just turns out it's just a normal effect of heat. This is because the bones burn and crumble into small pieces and then mix in with the remaining ash. At first glance, a responder would not easily distinguish ash from bone. After more than 30 years, Vince Calcagno feels he's finally found an answer to Beatrice Oski's mysterious death. The pile of ash and bone, combustibles only inches away that didn't catch fire, and her legs, untouched after the blaze consumed the rest of her, are all in line with Pope's experiment. Two weeks ago, um, I, I thought the jury was still out uh, with regard to spontaneous human combustion based on Dr. Pope's work. I am comfortable saying I think the jury is in. For most scientists and skeptics, there never really was a question. The Oski case is one that's going to not stay around very long in the annals of spontaneous human combustion. And in fact, the annals themselves may be about to go up in flames. For them, the answers come from tests and case studies. They point out that these provide logical explanations for this strange phenomenon. Given the scientific knowledge and all the repeatable burn studies I've done, there's things about the body and the fire environment that can make it look like spontaneous human combustion, but no, I don't, I don't believe it at all. But for Larry Arnold, the case is far from closed. In time, we might find the reason. Perhaps one of our successors in the next century will come up with the insight that we presently may not be seeing. Arnold can point to lingering questions. Cases like Helen Conway, who apparently burned in just 21 minutes, far faster than the wick effect consumes a body. For believers like Arnold, the controversy lives on, and the mystery remains unsolved.